Joining us now, Dr. Deborah Burks of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Doctor, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you. A month ago, you and President Trump were both talking about a total of 60,000 COVID-19 deaths. Take a look. It looks like we'll be at about a 60,000 mark, which is 40,000 less than the lowest number thought of. Look at how much the model has changed in just a week. Remember, just a week ago, it was 80,000. Now it's 60,000. Early this coming week, we're going to reach 100,000 deaths from the coronavirus, and those models that you're citing now talk about close to 150,000 deaths by August. What happened, doctor? I think a few things are together. So from the beginning, and I think when we had that first briefing, we talked about 1.2 million to 2.4 million um, and 100,000 to, to 240,000 people succumbing to this incredibly aggressive virus. Um, those are the figures that we continue to stand by in this first wave. And really understanding how to prevent future hospitalizations and future deaths is really what we're focused on every single day. But to press it a little bit, uh, a month ago you were saying we were going to come down below the low end of the model, which is 100 to 240,000 to 60,000. So I guess my question is, in this last month, did you underestimate the strength of the virus? Did uh, we reopen too soon? Did we reopen without sufficient restrictions? What I was saying in that briefing that you were talking about is what that current model was showing. There are different models we have been using all along and, and really trying to learn primarily not just from models, but understanding what has happened in Spain and Italy and the UK and really tracking those numbers. We understand that our mortality rates are less than those three countries, and that's really due to the incredible work of our frontline hospital workers. But we understand that these number of infections has led to this level of mortality. And our job now going forward is to do everything we can to prevent additional hospitalizations and additional mortality. Well, let me, let me pick up on that, doctor, because this is, as we said, Memorial Day weekend and people are going out more in public. A lot of them are going to beaches. Uh, we're running video here. Some people are social distancing, but the picture, as you probably can't see on the screen right now, in Venice Beach, California, big crowds of people, some of them close together, not wearing masks. How concerned are you by some of what you're seeing around the country this Memorial Day weekend? Well, you know, last time we spoke, I was concerned about people coming together without masks, even during the protest. And now I'm very concerned when people go out and don't maintain social distancing. What do we know that has changed? We now have excellent scientific evidence of how far droplets go when we speak or just simply talking to one another. And we know that it's important for people to socially interact, but we also know it's important that we have to have masks on if we're less than six feet, and that we have to maintain that six feet diff diff distance. We know being outside does help. Um, we know sun does help in killing the virus, but that doesn't change the fact that people need to be responsible and maintain that distance. We know you're talking to the governor from Arkansas. He's made it clear that there are super spreader events when people come together because of the nature of this virus and because of asymptomatic spread. And people aren't intentionally spreading the virus. They don't know they're infected, but they come together and they're under that six feet. And everybody who gets exposed to that person less than six feet has a chance of becoming infected. So do you think some of the, this crowd of people at beaches this Memorial Day weekend, is that a, a super spreader event? Well, Friday, when I discussed this during the press briefing, I was really hoping to convey that very clear message to the American people. 
we want you to be outside. We know that there are ways that you can even play tennis with marked balls so you're not touching each other's balls. We know there's a way for you to go out and play golf and spade distance, to hike, to be outside in nature, to be at the beach. But really within that is the absolute requirement because across the country we know that there is still virus out there. And we see what workplaces are doing to make it safe. We see what nursing homes are doing to try to make it safer for their residents. Let's even in public make sure that we're doing everything that we need to do to make it safe for others in public. President Trump said on Friday that he is now declaring that houses of worship are providing essential services and he wants governors to open houses of worship right away today. Take a look. If they don't do it, I will override the governors. In America, we need more prayer, not less. But as you know, there have been a few cases, not widespread, but there have been a few cases, one in Arkansas, some in California, where people, some of them asymptomatic with COVID-19, go to houses of worship and spread, uh, and there are more infections, and in some cases, even death. Is it safe to open all houses of worship across the country today? I think two things happened on Friday. Um, the president asked for the CDC to make sure there were guidelines posted to make it clear of how churches could open safely. And during then the press briefing, I made it clear that it's very important for governors and communities to let people know where there is still high levels of virus, like it is here in Washington, D.C., in Chicago, and in L.A., and to really ensure that those with vulnerabilities are protected. So although it may be safe for some to go to churches and social distance, it may not be safe for those with pre-existing conditions. And that's why in phase one and phase two, we've asked for those individuals with, with vulnerabilities to really ensure that they are protected and sheltering in place while we open up America. Then there are the issue of masks, which we touched on before, and we are seeing growing confrontations, for instance, in stores where customers say, you got to wear a mask, and some customers say, you are violating my rights. Here's an example of that. I'm asking this member to put on a mask because that is our company policy. So either wear the mask And I'm not doing it because I woke up in a free country. I'm asking you a public health question, not a legal question. What would you tell someone who says, I have a right not to wear a mask in public? What we have said to people is there's clear scientific evidence now by all the droplet experiments that happen and that others have done to show that a mask does prevent droplets from reaching others. And out of respect for each other, as Americans that care for each other, we need to be wearing masks in public when we cannot social distance. It's really critically important. We have the scientific evidence of how important mask wearing is to prevent those droplets from reaching others. Do you wish, I understand it's a special case, he's, uh, everybody around him has been tested, uh, and obviously he's on television, but both from a safety point of view and from a public messaging point of view, do you wish the president wore a mask in public? Well, the president did wear a mask while he was less than six feet in a occasion where that was important over, I think, when he was traveling um, last, last week. I think he, I'm not with him every day and every moment, so I don't know if he can maintain social distance. I've asked everybody independently to really make sure that you're wearing a mask if you can't maintain the six feet. I'm assuming that in majority of cases, he's able to maintain that six feet distance. Uh, finally, there were some promising reports uh, this week about uh, we might get a vaccine sooner than we expected. Here's the president on that this week. We're looking to, uh, when I say quickly, we're looking to get it by the end of the year if we can, maybe before. We're doing tremendously well. A month ago, you and Dr. Fauci were both talking about it taking 12 to 18 months to get a mask, uh, to get a vaccine. Now you're talking 
uh, about possibly by the end of the year, which would cut that timeline in half. I understand everybody wants it. How likely is it that we're going to see a vaccine readily available by the end of this year? I think what would make it potentially possible is what we're what the president has asked everyone to do in this public-private partnership with funding directly to make vaccine at risk. And what do I mean by that? That means making vaccine before we know its full safety and its full effect and it, what we call its efficacy profile, to make vaccine starting now as quickly as possible. So when there is that efficacy and safety signal. So we're not shortcutting the efficacy and safety testing. What we are shortcutting is the normal development time of manufacturing. And so really starting manufacturing what would be six months early or seven months early, that's how you can potentially shorten this by four to six or even eight months. And so that's what's happening now is taking the most promising candidates and getting them into manufacturing, ensuring that you can scale and produce these vaccines at the level that is needed for America. Well, we all hope that happens, you can be sure. Dr. Brooks, thank you. Thanks for your time this holiday thank weekend. You. Please come back.